this, and then it's like, <laughs> taking longer than normal. <laughs> All right, we are officially live and we are here with Jake Anderson. And so tell us a little bit about yourself, Jake. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, gosh, there's trying to think of the story and, and kind of, you know, giving you the, the overview of who I am. Just to kind of put it in a, in a short and sweet, you know, condensed clip note version. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, um, a bit of a serial entrepreneur. I've been in business now for about 11 years. And in 2012, I started a, an event lighting design company. Um, the first four years were all failure. <laughs> so it wasn't really until 2012 that I actually found some success. And um, now I still own that company to this day. Uh, I was able to step out of the, the, out of the operations in 2016 and had uh, and this company is actually based in Richmond. So um, I live in Roanoke, Virginia now, which is about three hours from the headquarters. So in 2017, I decided to make a family first decision and move back to my hometown, you know, had built the company to a level where it could pretty much stand on its two feet. It was staff had systems in place and moved back to my hometown. And um, now I'm here with my family. I've got two boys uh, married. Um, my wife's actually from Vermont, so we, we weren't going to move that far away. Plus, I can't stand the cold. And uh, so we decided to move to Roanoke. And um, now I'm, I'm starting a new venture, and I'm really focusing on entrepreneurial fathers. Uh, just because when I had started my business, I went through a very dark period uh, of time, especially in the beginning stages, where I didn't really know how to check out. Um, I felt like the business kind of controlled me in a way that was... Um, almost felt like a prison sentence. Like I couldn't check out. I, I, I was constantly thinking about work. I remember it, it really had a negative impact on my family and that relationship. And um, that's when I started making family first decisions on my business. That's when I stepped out of the operations. I built systems. I, I, I built a team. Um, you know, even moving away from my uh, from the headquarters was a family first decision. So I've always, since that time, I always made decisions around my family as number one, my business is number two, and it's actually really served me very well. Um, I'm much happier now. So I want to take that that experience and that background and bring it to entrepreneurial fathers and really help them in their missions and in creating businesses that serve them. That way, they have the time to serve their family to the highest level. So. Um, that's the whole point of the, of the Chief Executive Dad Movement and creating the Board of Fathers group and that community that I'm launching the first of the year, um, just kind of based on that experience and uh, and just you know what I've been through and being able to take take that and give back to that community of fathers. Yeah, that's really awesome. That's a lot. I mean, we have a lot in common. I'm doing the same thing with the 1,000 Dad Jobs, being like my goal is to help a thousand dads earn at least a thousand dollars a month from home. And the reason why I came up with that idea, I mean, it, it kind of hit me in a dream, but I had done a Facebook live similar to this. And uh, I had said that my goal was to have a million dollars in the bank by the time I was 52, which is about a year and a half from now. And then as I had, you know, I'm praying on it and I had the dream and it hit me. It was like lightning. It was like, I'm not serving anybody by saying I want a million dollars, right? That's, that's nothing that anybody else is going to get behind. Sure. But if I help a thousand dads earn a thousand dollars, not only am I serving those thousand dads, but also it's that same number. It's the same figure, the same goal mm. that I had originally created. So uh, that is where the term thousand dad jobs came from. And, uh, so uh, I've just been building this up for about a month and a half, I think, since, since you and I first got in contact. It, it kind of hit us both at the same time, I think. Um, yeah. Event lighting, that sounds exciting. Can you tell me more about that? Oh, yeah. So, um, so it's funny because my background is actually in banking. I was a bank examiner. And, you know, anything creative was just not at all you know, in what I did, I was a finance nerd. I was in numbers and I was an analyst and still am to this day, very much so an analyst that's never really left me. But, um, I went to school. I wanted to be an entrepreneur when I was ever since I was 18. And when I got out of college, I had studied business finance in college and, 
And um, I thought, okay, well, I'm out now. It's time to, to make those moves and be an entrepreneur. And um, I ended up partnering up with this, uh, it was an older gentleman who was really into the concert productions. And that's when the failures happened, that there's four years of failures because I was trying to book entertainment and I was going after, you know, people who, who could buy national talent because that was his wheelhouse. He was, he was producing these giant country music shows all over the United States. So having access to those resources, that's where I was trying to take my career. Well, it ended up just kind of the, the lighting really found me. I was uh, on LinkedIn one day and there was a venue. I was living in Richmond. There was a venue, a small boutique restaurant type venue up in Northern Virginia that was uh, having an open house. And at this time, I was trying to go after like the weddings and special events market and um, more specifically with entertainment. And I was pivoting a little bit away from trying to go after the big national talent buyers. And I went, I reached out to her. I said, hey, I'd love to be part of your event. You know, I can, I can handle entertainment. You know, we do have some production capabilities too. And she was like, well, I don't really care about your entertainment. I was like, Good, there we go again. <laughs> but she, she said, you know, we really are looking for somebody to partner with on lighting here. So really, I didn't even realize that people hired companies to bring lighting into a space that already had lighting. I just thought it was kind of a, you know, it's there. So what's the point? Don't you just dim the lights back and we're good to go, but <laughs> there's so much more to it. And so that's kind of what started. So I just started out with, I just did some up lighting, you know, just around the perimeter, just kind of create a nice little ambient glow in the room. And um, that's what I did for that restaurant. And from there, you know, I was getting referred to different planners and venues and, and I was, I, I had a knack for it. And it was a creative, it was a creative outlet for me that worked for me. And I think it was because it, it had a technical aspect to it that I connected very well with. Like I can't draw to save my life, but this is not drawing. This is kind of looking at a room and figuring out how to engineer a design to make the room come to life. And um, so now we've got, you know, at that time it was, you know, it was just my garage had a couple guys helping me. Now we've got about 4,000 square feet of space with, you know, chandeliers and pendants and LED systems and different spots and about 18 employees. So it just as over the years, you know, since 2012, since I launched it, it's just kind of grown and grown and grown to become, you know, quite the, quite the little business. And um, um, so we've done, you know, we do a lot of weddings, a lot of corporate events now too. Um, some big corporations that we work with um, out of the central Virginia area. And, uh, you know, we'll do their holiday party. Sometimes they have different um, just, you know, it just depends on the event. If it's a special event, sometimes it's like an internship event I've seen where they got all their interns are bringing in, but they're doing some big kind of thank you type event for them. And, but they want to really make it nice and add, add design and flair to it. So yeah, that's you know, really awesome. I, love lighting because i'm a photographer by trade okay yeah so when i see beautiful lighting i just uh i, I really appreciate uh -huh. it so before you started learning how to paint with light and reaching out to that more artistic side that you're you're falling into now and, and what an interesting niche to kind of fall into right mm, yeah. um and unique but before you got to that point where you you became more of a light artist were you still working in the banking company as you were building your business yeah toes in all in yeah it was uh no there was certainly a period of time um that's actually it's actually really interesting that you bring this up because um up until it was 2014 i remember it was because my first son was born february 8th 2014 and i quit my full-time job the end of january of 2014 <laughs> so i quit my job and had my son all at the same time my first son at the same time but I had been, I knew it was time. It was a calculated risk. It wasn't just kind of a leap of faith. Um, you know, it, honestly, in that now that I kind of go back and I think through my experience, sometimes I have a hard time believing too much. Like there, there's definitely a lot of faith you have to have, but you really need to kind of look at your situation and really make a calculation on your moves that you're making. And that's really what I did. I knew that, you know, it, it, I could see the demand in the market. It was certainly there. The growth rates were there. Um, you know, looking at the market in itself, I didn't really have a lot of, con I didn't really have any primary competitors. And the one that I did have had, had kind of exited the local market. So it was pretty much all me. And um, 
So, you know, there was a lot of indicators that signaled this is a good time for me to go ahead and exit and leave, even though from the outside looking in, it may seem like a very scary decision. But, you know, like I said, it was, yeah, it was several years that I did it on the side. It, those were the very, those, I call those the dark ages because it was, <laughs> I mean, I was doing crazy stuff. I mean, working, you know, I, I would be, you know, examining a bank in Northern Virginia and then, you know, Thursday or, or Wednesday, I'd get off work and then drive to Richmond for a networking event and then drive back to Northern Virginia to go to bed to be at work on Thursday morning do stuff like that all the time, just running myself rampant all over the place and trying to keep up with it. To, you know, all my leave was used for meetings and uh, I just was constantly dancing around a, a very delicate schedule. But eventually, you know, and that's when, and that, that's, that's the other thing too. I, I got to a point where I just couldn't do it anymore. And, right. um, and the year that I went full time, we'd more than doubled in revenue. And that showed me that, hey, look at what your business does when it has your full attention. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, when when uh, when your son is about to be born and you're considering quitting your job and going full time onto a, a, a project that you've created yourself, there's a term that I coined called strategic urgency. And I'm sure that you felt like that, that. As, as soon as you cut loose, you were like, I have to do everything I can to support my family and to mm. support my son, but you still, I mean, as you're designing all of this and, and creating this lifestyle for yourself, you still know that the reason you wanted to do this in the first place was so that you could spend more time with your family. So how was the pull between the new urgency that you had in creating this business and getting it off the ground in that, you know, really the first year, like, it, when you're when you're those first four years of failure, the dark ages that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you were probably more focused on your banking business than you were on your personal business. And so when you really went full in on your personal business, how did you find what people like to call the work life balance? Well, it was very tough because I wasn't used to it. I wasn't used to like I, I felt I remember when I first went full time. Um, I remember just thinking, I got to do whatever it takes to keep this ship, ship afloat because now it's all on me. I don't have the safety net anymore. And that's gone. And I have to execute. And I'm still by myself. I'm still the only full time person, you know, within this business. Also, that year, too, I also rented an office space because I knew I needed like a little showroom and a place to meet clients. And I wanted to make sure that I positioned myself correctly for that for that exit out of that job. And, um, but it, it was, it wasn't really until 2016 that I really found true work-life balance because in 2014, when I left and came full-time, I didn't understand how to let go at all. I did everything myself. I didn't trust anybody other than myself, even though there's people who are better than me at doing this particular task. And I didn't realize that <laughs> until I actually delegated it. But um, I, that, that, that was, I mean, 20, I didn't really leave the dark ages until probably it was the end of 2015. 2014 and 2015, I worked more 2014 and 2015 doing just that business by itself than I did in 2013. And, you know, really 2012 and 2013, especially those two years were the heaviest years for me. Those were the hardest years. Um, in terms of um, trying to dance around a schedule, but I actually worked more just doing my one business in 14 and 15 than I did doing both a job and a side business in 13 and 14, or I'm sorry, 12 and 13. I'm getting my years mixed up. That's all right. I know that sounds a little strange, but, and I think it's because I overexerted myself with the fear of failure. Like, I don't want to fail. I don't want this thing to collapse on me. So I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to, to kind of maintain the ship on my own. And it right. wasn't until I realized at the end of 2015 that if I don't let go of certain things in my operation and delegate, then this business is just going to completely run me over. I mean, yeah. I was working hundred hour weeks. So it was awful, you know? And then once I did oh, that, it was really scary. And then it actually ended up, um, actually ended up working out really well. Yeah. Uh, Tim Ferriss talked about that in the four hour work week. He said that he mm. found, he realized that he was the bottleneck in his own business. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. You, you will become the bottleneck. And 
you know, there's things you can do to make, to make that transition easier. It's a lot of it's mindset. It's just coming to terms with yourself that, you know, there's certain steps you can take to, to properly plan for that type of, you, you, you have to have systems. That's the biggest thing. You got to have systems in place. You got to have documented processes. You got to be able to set expectations for people. You got to, you know, there's little things to when they're not really little, but things that I didn't think about early on, like establishing core values. You know, whenever I hire my team now, I always, when my interview process is, is nothing but like aligning core values. Every interview question gives me an answer to how they align with a core value of mine. And that allows you to pull in people who really work well within your culture. Um, so you just have to think the think- there is the, you know, the HR world that we come from when we're in corporate America saying, oh, you can't say this, you can't say that, you can't ask somebody what they believe in or whether they smoke or not, because you're going to be, you know, belittling them or something to that effect. And uh, when you get the realization that this is my company and I'm not going to work with somebody who I don't get along with, like this is, this is mm-hmm. what I'm building. I'm not working somebody else's company now, so I don't have to follow their rules anymore. And once you reach that level of freedom, mm-hmm. that that really uh, takes you up to the next level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, you know, hiring. I, I would say just dealing, managing a team is probably the most challenging part of owning a business. That would be if if I could give that answer. It definitely would be managing a team, um, setting expectations, and and keeping everybody focused. I mean, it's. Uh, you know, but it, it's, it's just part of the, it's part of what you sign up for. Um, you, you really, it's, it's healthy. It's healthier to have a team and have that support system than try to do it all yourself. Um, I just, I just know that during, you know, until I made that transition, that's what really helped me kind of move to a state where, um, I can, you know, I can be more focused on the things that matter to me most. I can do other projects. I mean, right now the company requires maybe the five to 10 hours a week out of me, you know, for as far as oversight goes. And I have very high level meetings with people, but they're doing the operations. And um, so it allows me to do things like chief executive dad and put together, you know, programs like this where I can still continue to serve and further my mission. So um that's why, that's why I was like, I'm a little bit of a serial entrepreneur, you know, in that, in that regard, because I just love entrepreneurship and I love creating systems and modeling things. And, um, the brand development's really something interesting to me as well. That's very exciting. That was actually one of my favorite parts of the whole process was the brand development piece and going through that process. So great. Tell me some more about chief executive dad. That sounds exciting. Yeah. So, um, well, Chief Executive Dad is is a podcast that I am I'm launching, and it's starting on January first. And the whole premise of it is to um, I'm so I'm interviewing different experts in different fields, and and just talking around the, the topics of, of business, uh, personal development, family, and um, and marketing as well. And more specifically, you know, I it, it, for me, I've been really in tune in the online space now for a little over a year. So a lot of the, a lot of the experts and people I've been bringing on to the show have been more, um, you know, when it comes to specific business, I guess, specific businesses, it's been more related to online business um, versus brick and mortar. And uh, not that I'm opposed to talking about brick and mortar. I just have found, a lot of fascination with the internet. <laughs> I, I started last year. Um, I, I really last year actually started working on a software project, which I've decided to shelf. Um, I was developing a, a SaaS or self, software as a service for people who don't know what that means, and um, uh, you know, hired developers. And I just remember thinking, it's like I'm working on a project with somebody in Serbia right now, like it's no big deal, right? And that's just amazing. And you know you're able, we were talking cause you're in Maryland and I'm in Roanoke. So we're what, like four hours away. Yeah. It's like, we're like we, I, yeah. It's like, we're like <laughs> in the internet world, we're like neighbors. And uh, cause I've, you know, you're just communicating with people all over the world. Like, and it's just completely seamless. So to me, it's just amazing how technology has allowed us to reach people effortlessly anywhere in the world. We can collaborate with them. We can sell to them. 
we can communicate, collab, you know, it's just, just the reach is incredible through all the technology that's been created. And that just seems to be where business is really moving. And um, I mean, look at the large, the biggest business in the world is, is an internet company, Amazon, you know? And uh, so that seems to be the, the theme of the type of business, I guess the business subject um, that type experts I've been bringing onto my show. So um, yeah, it's just all about like, I'm a dad and I'm an entrepreneur and they're, those are the two roles. Um, obviously being a husband too, I kind of, even though it's not part of being a dad, I kind of bundle that in there too. I guess family, just <laughs> family in itself and entrepreneurship. That's where, that's where my passion is. So it's really a passion project for me. Um, you know, I'm going to, you know, I've got a Facebook group, which is where anybody who listens to the show and they really enjoy the content and they want to further like kind of collaborate and communicate with this world that I'm creating. That's when I've created the board of fathers, which is a coalition of family first dadpreneurs. And that's my Facebook group. Yeah. And, it, yeah. And you bring up that term dadpreneurs. I've heard that there's some controversy around that. Term. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize that until um, I guess it's, I guess some people view it. I mean, the way I look at it is you've got the term dad and entrepreneur, and those are two great things. And it's a word that got merged together. And, um, and, you know, I kind of, honestly, I kind of like that there's a little bit of controversy around it because it creates contrast and filtering for my brand. And, um, and I like that, that kind of goes like, I've got a very rebellious, like, like I love rebellious branding and finding ways to like, when you're a little rebellious and how you brand yourself, you create a lot of contrast and you stand out. And when you stand out, people hear you above all the noise and they're going to get to be more attracted to whatever it is you're doing. And you have this like magnetic pull that you have on the market. And, uh, and I learned about this back in 2013 when I was working with, a, it was a branding and marketing firm that I had hired for my lighting company. Um, it, was, it was the largest investment I made, um, at least especially at that time, just into a single, to anything consultative for my business. And um, I remember the, the owner was very successful. <laughs> it was working with you know, big, large companies all the way down to small businesses. But now, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I know I couldn't afford him right now or his firm now based on, you know, how quickly they were moving up in pricing. But I remember sitting down with him because I was asking, I was like, what do you do to market your business? And he's like, well, I know this sounds kind of strange coming from a marketing firm, but I don't really, I don't really like advertise or do any of that. It's word like, of mouth. I'm like, well, the way he put it, he said, <laughs> I, I gravitate, I, I like to gravitate. I like my brand to pull people into me. And I like creating a brand that's so strong that people just gravitate to it. And that's, that's the strategy that I've taken. And, and it makes my, my calls to marketing a lot, lot less when I'm able to create a brand that's really strong. And he's like, that's what, like, we, we like to be very rebellious in our branding. And, um, and an example of that, <laughs> I remember going into his, the first time I met with him, his strategist or the account rep who I was working with handed me her business card. And on the business card, it didn't have a title. It said Midnight Panther. And I thought, <laughs> what, you know, what is it? So what, what's your role here? And she was like, she kind of laughed. She's like, yeah, those are our spirit animals. And he gives me a card and it says Lansing <laughs> Narwhal. And then if you like look at their website, it's like all written. It has like Scandinavian dialect. So it's like, it's the name, the name of the company is Yogg. So it's like, welcome to the land of Yogg. You know, it's like all written kind of like in Scandinavian, but they've like put all this personality into it and it all just makes sense. And it's hilarious and it's just, it's so entertaining. And when you read it, you're like, oh, I want somebody to create a brand like that for me. And that's exactly how I felt. It's like, I don't want to put a title on my car. And I was, so we were lighting professors. So we all had professor names. So I was Professor Edison and we had Professor Lumen and Professor Halogen. And when we would give our business cards to people, they would look at it and they would always smile and go, oh, that's that's pretty clever. That's cool. Right. I like that. Right. And uh, it always it would catch memorable. their, yeah, would just catch their attention. But that's rebellious. You know, that's to do something like that. It's kind of, you're taking a little bit of a risk. And um, and they were, you know, they, they wore flannel t-shirts and jeans and they dressed very casual and they're going into 
you know, meetings of, you know, multi-billion dollar corporations to talk about their branding dress like that, giving the card to the CEO that says Nancy, Nancy Narwhal on it. And it's just, to me, it's just amazing that, you know, that's true, real creativity. You're able to kind of step away from that status quo and do things with your branding that creates this contrast. And um, yeah, it's either going to click with the client or it's not. And you know, right yeah. away, whether it's going to be a good fit instead of trying, I was telling this to one of my clients the other day, I said that you can either find people who already know that they have a problem and educate them on how you can fill it, or you can try and educate people on what their problem is, but that's going to be much more difficult than trying to find somebody who already knows they have a problem. Yeah. Oh, amen to that. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, people, when you're speaking with people about, well, I, I, I don't think I've ever, I don't know if I've ever tried to convince anybody that they have a problem, but I, I know most people don't like to be told that they, <laughs> that they have a problem. And, and, and even if they, even they, even if they do, um, unless they're open-minded, but I mean, that's a great way of putting it. I mean, when they know that they have a problem and you can educate them on how to fix it, you know, you have a much, you know, much stronger chance of, of making that connection. Right. And you're not even selling at that point. You're just mm. educating. And then they're like, Hey, yeah. that's what I need. How can you help me? And it's just, it builds that relationship. And that's what I really like is relationship marketing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that was, that, that the educational component, like with my lighting company, I named it lighting professors because I wanted to be educational. And I was also constantly asked, you know, by the market where people that were inquiring about the service, like they would come to me and say, well, you know, I guess I need lighting. I don't really know what this is or what, the, what it's for, but you know, I was told to talk to you. So I would have to spend a lot of time educating them. Like that's, I didn't pitch anything. I just, explain lighting and made it very educational and that's when i came up with that name and um and then it kind of extrapolated into like professor names and even like our services we had the associates the bachelors the masters and the doctorate and uh, we even you know so we even used the branding and we carried it into our service packages and anywhere any way we can find congruency um i felt like really made a difference in kind of creating that brand experience you know, that, that people really connect well with. Yeah, I get it. I'm, uh, I'm an, I'm addicted to watching, um, webinars and I was watching a Stephen Larson webinar the other day. And he said that he spends as much time filtering people away from his company as he does bringing people into his company. So that's very similar to what you're referring to there with, with, you know, being very, uh, uh, eclectic and saying mm -hmm. you're just not gonna fit with what we're doing over here and that's okay yeah right? well and especially like you mentioned the dadpreneur name kind of having a controversial um tone to it um you know that's that's great because the people who don't see it as controversial those are the people who i want in the group right. and they're going to look at that word and they're going to go Oh yeah. Cause I had made a post actually about it. <laughs> it created, stirred the pot a little bit. That, that's when I realized how controversial it was. And, um, um, but I could tell, you know, I think there was 200 some comments and yeah, it was, it was, it got a lot of traction, a lot, a lot of, a uh, lot of attention. And, uh, and, and, and I don't know exact what the exact numbers were, but I would say probably 170 of them out of the 250 or whatever it was were, were, were good, positive, like, yes, I love this. And then there was probably 50 that had this just negative, negative outlook to it. So I was like, perfect. There's 50 that I don't want. And there's 170 that I do want. And right. that's, that's the way I kind of looked at it. Well, when I was, uh, when I first got out of the military, I, I, I served two, two different I had like a break in service. Mm -hmm. And when I first got out, my first wife, who is a great person, just, uh, I kind of screwed that up. Um, she was still in the military. So I got out and then served as what the, at that time they called the dependent husband. So it had not only this negative con connotation that you were the guy that like Mr. Mom kind of guy, but mm -hmm. also that your wife or spouse is in the military and you're just kind of floating on what they're doing. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Uh, and so it had that negative connotation to it. Now they, they only say dependent spouse, whether it's a male or a female, and they're trying to do away with the, you know, the, the rift of, you know, cause there are a lot more men who, uh, who stay home and take care of the kids now. In fact, I work with, um, Dr. J. Paul Rand, and he created, he wrote a book called The Dad Job, and it's a, a workbook that men can go through to, you know, increase their, uh, to be more dynamic in yeah. the dad job, you know, and mm -hmm. so, so I'm working with him, and that's, that's where the, the idea came from, and um, one of the things that he mentioned is that there is, people don't like to admit it, but there's more than 7 million men who are stay-at-home dads now and the reason why they can't get the number quite right is because if a man stays home and takes care of his children but the wife has not been working for a year or more he's not considered a stay-at-home dad like it, they don't check that block if a woman is staying at home with the children and the father goes out to work she's like instantly a stay-at-home mom it's like it's yeah. And people just understand that, right? And then right. to go out and get social help or uh, social help for single moms, it's all over the place. Only 10% of single fathers get social help. Huh. So um, uh, Paul likes to call Dr. Rand, Paul likes to call uh, the dad job the fastest growing career in America. You know, I I never really had, I, 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 didn't, I wasn't aware of, because I guess the word dadpreneur has this, the meaning behind it is you're kind of a stay at home dad, but you're, you're doing a little side thing, I guess, or maybe a little side type business. Um, I, I had always, I guess I had always thought that I'm just a dad as an entrepreneur. So I'm a dadpreneur. Um, and the reason I had thought of that term was like in my life, because right now, like I'm in my home office, you know, actually, my kids are like right behind that door. And I told my wife, it's like, I want to be on the show. So <laughs> keep them under control. Uh, you're welcome to call them in. I all the time, like my kids try and stay away when I'm doing this <laughs> stuff. Cause as soon as I'm, I see them, I'm like, no, get over here. We're doing it. Come on. And that's, yeah. my, that's my son right there. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah. that's Prince right there. Nice. You know where I come yeah. from. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. And yeah. You know, I'm, I'm drinking out of a pink Winnie the Pooh mug, nice. not, not by choice. It was just the first one I grabbed, but you know, it's just serves the purpose. It's just, it serves the purpose. And, um, but that's like, for me, like when I think of a dadpreneur, I think of, you know, my, um, my day where I'm at home and my kids, they're, they're in school during the day, but there are days when they're sick and I'm at home. My, my wife works, you know, she temps and does hygiene, um, picks up hygiene shifts throughout the week. And, um, but when she's working, if I'm at home and the kids are at home, there's a lot of times where they're busting in the office and they're playing and they're hanging out with me and, but I'm still handling my business. And, but it's just kind of this balance that I have to take on. And that's like, that's my, my mind, like that's being a dadpreneur, but I still have, you know, I have a pretty decent business. That I'm still overseeing that's, that's enrichment. It's definitely beyond what you would consider like a little side gig. You right. Know, Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. No, so. but um, there's also nothing wrong with the wife going out to the corporate world because there are more women in the corporate world mm -hmm. now than there are men. Sure. And, um, you know, if the dad is staying home, I don't care which parent stays at home, but I think that a parent should stay at home and take care of the children. And I don't think that our economy really allows for that anymore. Now yeah. I work from home full time and my wife stays home. Uh, she's actually getting a job next week, which she's been wanting to do for a while. So that's really cool. And uh, I think that one of the things that has helped families get a little extra income as they were, you know, the father is going out to work and the wife's staying at home. For the past 40 years, the big thing has been MLM. And MLMs have mostly been geared towards women because there's like Mary Kay and Avon and Tupperware yeah. and Pampered Chef. And women like to get together and have just social chats. And then if a woman says, yeah, you know, I, I get this, I get this free Tupperware or I get, you know, this stuff from Pampered Chef and I invite people over to parties and it's fun and I make a few hundred bucks or a thousand bucks a month and it helps out. And we buy diapers with it and all that stuff. That's great. 
Yeah. That is fantastic. Yeah. And that is what that is how MLMs have been built for the past 40 years. But now there are more dads home than there are moms. And men just don't have those social outlets like that. I mean, we have sports and maybe go camping and something. But if if you and I went out camping and I was like, hey, check this out too. I've been making a couple hundred bucks extra. You'd be like, that's great. Are you trying to sell me something? Right? Like <laughs> instantly there's that, there's yeah. that. Uh, again, controversy there. But uh, what may, what men like, and I like that you said this earlier, men like having tools and men like having some structure and, and they need systems in place. So yeah. one of the things that I've done is I've created systems for MLM so that you can do, I don't know if you know, I work for ClickFunnels. So I've taken the ClickFunnels and then I've built um, lead gen into it. And I've built uh, uh, automated systems for for uh, recruiting people, so you don't have to talk to friends and family anymore. Mm -hmm. which yeah, is, which is the huge thing. Like one, yeah. once you've asked those eight people and ruined a couple of relationships that way, um, what, what it? Where is your where is your warm market? You don't have anything anymore. So we created lead gen and we've created recruiting systems, and it's all automated now. Yeah. So I, the reason I like MLM for that is because there are some great MLMs that have fantastic products that you can't get anywhere else. And getting into an MLM business is like 50 bucks a year plus product. And, right. and you can't do that with anything else. So if, if you're looking for a, a low level job to get into to try and make some extra money, then I think that's really the way to go and get your feet wet. But um, at the same time, you know, if, if you're able to run a six figure income from home and and take care of the family that's i mean that's everybody's goal right just to get to that point well i mean yeah i guess it's uh, you know i've had quite the paradigm shift you know over the years you know when i first got into business oh it, it was all about making as much money as i could make and building this giant empire and i just don't i don't really care about that anymore like i just want to be happy i just want to be with my family do something I love every day. Um, I, you know, whatever, whatever the vehicle is, you know, it doesn't really matter to me as long as it aligns with my core. And um, I had last year, and I'll give you a little story to kind of go with this. You know, last year I, I had come to the realization, this has kind of been going on for a little while. Like I've just lost the passion for my lighting business for, for a while and it's it's become a situation where I feel almost like I have to force myself a little bit to engage with it, and that's not that's not a good thing, especially as a business owner. And um, so I had <coughs> started marketing actually earlier this year. I had started marketing or listing it with a broker to have it marketed for sale, and I uh, was kind of planning my exit strategy. But in parallel to that, I was like, okay, well, what's my next move? Because I need something to you know transition into which is really what chief executive dad and that kind of whole thing is going to be. But, uh, but before that I had, um, it was this last year, uh, I was kind of sitting down. I mean, I had probably 20 different business ideas kind of going through my head and I was like, well, I got to pick one. And then I made a decision. This is the decision I made. I was like, well, what's the thing I know most about? Well, I know a lot about creating a business in the special events industry. I've done it. And, and, if, and frankly, it's very rare I don't know anybody that um, that owns a business in that industry and lives three hours from it. It's just kind of rare to see that. Um, so I, I can leverage that social proof. And I was going to write a book and create a course on business systems and in the events industry. And I started creating a software that was based around a void that I had recognized and have seen you know, for years, you know, just, it's just clearly there and I was going to fill that void. So that's when I hired that development team out of Eastern Europe to work with me. I spent all this money on development, I have a very nice prototype and I was going to be a thought leader in special events. And I had also this physical product and I was going to launch this year's May of 2018 and I had done all this work, had all this stuff that I've been creating, and then May comes and I'll launch. And it's like, okay, now it's time for me to be that thought leader and for me to publish and you know speak out. And I just completely froze. 
And I, I thought, man, this is not good. You know, I have all this resistance right now. I don't even know what to say. I don't, I don't know anything. I just have no idea what I want to say. And um, I thought, well, this is probably natural. I've never been very outspoken on social media or any place. It's, it's probably just natural resistance. You know, it'll, it'll pass. And then five months went by and still nothing, still tons of resistance. And I had to come to the realization, you know, the, the, the writing was on the wall the whole time and I've been staring at it. I just chose to avoid it. And that's, I just don't care about weddings and special events. It's just doesn't anything, I, I, even though I know a lot about it and I know a lot about building a business in that industry, and I definitely have value that I could give to that industry and could monetize it. It doesn't align with here at all. And that's when I decided to take this, you know, giant investment that I had made into this project and say, you know what, I'm going to, have to put this on the shelf. Maybe I'll find a partner one day that might want to take this and pick it up and they can run with it and they're passionate about it, but it's just not for me. And I had to go right back to square one and, um, and I took a different approach instead of like thinking about what was up here, I started thinking about what was in here. And that's when I came to, uh, you know, chief executive dad, you know, I, I grew, I didn't have a bad family dynamic growing up, but it wasn't a very close family. And, um, you know, with myself, you know, having kids and especially going through those dark times, like it's really become a high priority for me. And, uh, and that's, that's, it's a family first business for me. You know, it's, it's not about making millions of dollars. Um, I'd love to get a two comic club award. It'd be great to have on my wall, but it's not, it's not, I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it for having to be, to be able to wake up in the morning, doing what I love with what lines here and to be able to support my family and provide, you know, what, you know, provide the lifestyle that we want to live to be able to get back to my community. And that's kind of really what, what I'm in it for now. So, yeah, if I could just make money playing guitar for my church, I'd be perfectly happy with that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, you and I have a lot in common. Um, I've done so much of the same things. Like when I first got into photography, I thought, yeah, I'm going to take pictures of, you know, every pretty girl and then do weddings on the side and make my money that way. And um, wasn't really comfortable with doing either once I started getting into it. Like the, mm -hmm. with the wedding thing, you start realizing that it is the most stressful day of somebody's life and you have to capture every perfect part of it and <laughs> kind of like avoid all of the stressful parts and yeah. present that to somebody and they have to be completely satisfied with what you've given them because you can never redo it. It's such a stressful industry. It's really so hard. stressful. Yeah. I, gosh, I could go on and on about just the stress that goes into being part of a wedding is you're right. You don't get redos and it's like the most important day of their life. And they've got all these, all this family and friends that are flying in from all over the, all over the place. And, and they've spent tens of thousands of dollars on this five hour, you know, party, basically. I know it's a wedding, it's a reception and it's beautiful and everything, but yeah, you know, I've and I've seen, you know, just being in the industry for years, I've just seen some things that you know, I it's just personal. It's just it's just my personal take on it. It's I, I don't, you know, have any judgment to anybody who wants to spend a lot of money on a wedding. That's fine. I didn't do it. But the thing that was really sad for me is that I would see couples walking in and they're going into debt to pay for this thirty, forty thousand dollar wedding. Oof. And that's how they're starting their marriage off. And I felt like I was part of it, you know, mm -hmm. even though it's not my decision, I'm just providing a service. But, you know, you, you just you're just watching them make a terrible decision to start off their marriage. You know, you're going tens of thousands of dollars into debt. And that's that that's just one example of, of, of why it was hard for me to be a thought leader in that industry, because there's a lot that I don't agree with. And that's what, you know, as I'm trying to be, you've got, you know, if you're going to be a thought leader, you've got to be enthusiastic. You've got to be authentic. And it's hard for me to be that way when I know in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about all those couples I saw walk through my door, parking, parking it on a credit card, parking it on a credit card, excuse me, and starting their life off, their marriage off deep, deep, deep in debt. And I think that's really important. And you should put that out there. Because that's what you're really in touch with is is how these 
how these couples are putting themselves into such financial stress at the yeah. very beginning of their relationship. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that should really be brought to the forefront of our society. And I think that a lot more, more uh, of the, the younger generations are seeing that. And, yeah. You know, I they're think doing so too. hippie weddings or, or, you know, give everybody a Polaroid camera and that's their photos for the wedding. I think those are beautiful. I love photos like that. In fact, I gave my mm -hmm. son a little, uh, it was about the size of a, just a little digital camera and said, you know, walk around and take pictures of the wedding. And, and those are some of the best pictures we have. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I, I think there's going to be a shift in that industry as time goes on because it's just not sustainable. I, you know, if it wasn't for Capital One and City and, and, and you know, Chase, they're the ones who finance my business. Mm. You know, um, I just don't see how that's sustainable. And it's just not a good way to start your marriage off. And well, it I, makes a lot more sense to put thirty thousand dollars into a business than it does to put thirty thousand dollars into a party for your wedding. And it's not really for you either. It's it's for your it's right. for the guest. It's for the people. That's where your money's going. Is to entertain the people that are going to attend. Right. And um, so I yeah, it, it's just things like that were made it very difficult for me to to feel you know feel connected with it like I should be. And um, and I love the art behind it. There was a lot of art behind that type of service, and you can appreciate it too, being a photography. But but when you're when you're faced with this, with this period of time where you have to be pretty, per pretty close to perfect in your execution. And even when you are pretty close to perfect, it still may not be good enough for the person. <laughs> it's right. just, it's, and, and you're, you know, you're the days leading up to it. You're like losing sleep, trying to, and that's, that's where my, that's what made it so hard for me to check out because I'm, mm -hmm. you know, we would have, I mean, right now, you know, last year we had 14 weddings in one weekend that we did, you know, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot to think about and a lot of, you know, very important days to keep in mind as you're, as you're trying to execute. In one weekend. Yeah. So I how mean, many crews did you have running to do that? Well, our, when, when we do, you know, that's the most we had ever done, but we, we would start our installations on Tuesday and then, you know, by the time Saturday would come, we'd have our technicians disperse out to the event sites. And it's just logistical planning from, you mm -hmm. know, you're starting installs on Tuesday and, um, and then you just line everything up and uh, just, you know, it's, it's, it's a long week. <laughs> it's a really long week. That's for sure. Especially when you have some big ones sprinkled in there and they're in different parts of the state. And um, actually one of the biggest weddings I had done, early on was actually in Maryland. It was on a private farm up in your neck of the woods. Um, that was back in 20, 2014 or 2015. And um, so we'll, we'll go up that way every once in a while. But um, anyway, I, I diverse. <laughs> well, we will we'll <laughs> definitely meet up for coffee. We're not that far apart. No, absolutely. I'd love to. I, I, and I'd make it up there, you know, frequent enough to where, um, you know, I'll definitely keep you in mind. When yeah, I in fact, way. Um, our pastor from Korea just moved to uh, North Carolina, so we'll be driving down that way, probably pass through where you're at. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Just hit me up and let me know. I'll be around. I should be. So uh, tell us where we find your podcast. So it's, um, <clears throat> I am launching, uh, I, I got to get the website finished. So to probably, I would say if you're looking for it on iTunes, it should be approved sometime this week. It's just Chief Executive Dad. You can find it on iTunes. Um, it's not there right now because it just hasn't gotten approved, but it's in queue right now with iTunes for approval. Um, it's launching January 1st, and, um, and I'm actually going to be working on a website for the podcast as well. That way I can kind of, you know, get, a, you know, get away from the standard simple cast site and actually have, have a place to really put all my episodes and brand it the way I want to. And that'll be chiefexecutivedad.com. And then actually, with if you the just- dad without the S- she yeah, dad. Yep, yeah. dad without the S. That's right. And then, um, that. and then boardoffathers.com. Now that does have an S. Um, if you just type boardoffathers.com, I've actually got it pointed to my Facebook group, so it's easy for people to remember if they want to go check that out. And that's also 
you can join now, but it's actually going to be launching as well on January 1st. Awesome. Well, that's great. I'm so glad that we got on tonight and had a chance yeah. to really meet and get to know each other. Yeah, I appreciate and, you uh, having me. Of course, you know, contact me anytime you need. And uh, I'm, uh, um, I'm looking forward to what you do with the, I did sign up for Board of Fathers, actually. So I signed up for the group. Okay, cool. And I'm yeah. excited to see what's going on in there. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I'll be, I'll be actually approving everything on January 1st. I'm just finishing up some of the videos and introductions and things I'm going to be doing that way when I open it up, it's full fledged, ready to go. Cool. All right. And we've got everything that we've got on thousanddadjobs.com and we'll be, we'll have this up on um, YouTube tomorrow and we'll have it on the podcast by the end of the weekend. So actually Saturday, I should have it up Saturday as well. So everything should be up tomorrow. Awesome. Looking All forward right. to it. Yeah. Hey, thanks for jumping on. God bless you. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Christopher. Bye.